If Christ died for us, why do we die? That's a fair enough question. It's based on the preface that Christ died for us, and that in itself is a, is a biblical principle. The Apostle Paul says quite clearly in Romans chapter 5 that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So plain and simply, it is factual that the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. And hence the question, if he died for us, why do we die? The problem with the question is that it erroneously implies that the Lord Jesus Christ died instead of us. And that is not a scriptural teaching. The Bible does not teach that the Lord Jesus Christ died instead of us, but rather he died that we might, or the faithful, might be able to inherit eternal life. If we ask the question, when will the faithful inherit eternal life? The faithful will inherit the eternal life at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth and the establishment of his kingdom. And so the teaching of the scripture is that the reward of the righteous is yet future. Everlasting life is the reward of the faithful at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the hope of the Bible. Not that we do not die, but that we might live forever. And there's a real difference. As most of the faithful at this current or today, are dead and buried and corrupted back to dust, and yet they will live forever. How will that happen? At the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith will be raised from the dead and granted immortal life or eternal life. The Apostle Paul also comments in 2 Timothy 4, where he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So the Apostle Paul had finished a very faithful life in his walk before God. His hope, as he states, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. And so the hope of the Apostle Paul not, was not that he should not die, but at that day, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he might receive everlasting life. The very last book of the Bible contains the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ to the faithful. And the Lord Jesus Christ told them then in Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And so the reward of the faithful is future. The reward of the faithful is coming at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to answer the question, if Christ died for us, why do we die? The answer is, even though Christ died for us, mankind will continue to die until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth, when he'll give eternal life to the faithful. That is the simple answer to the question. If Christ died for us, why do we die? Because the reward is yet faithful. And yet that answer, ladies and gentlemen, is not really satisfactory as it, it skirts around the real issue. And the problem is we're not actually asking the right question. The right question we should be asking is why do we die and how do we benefit from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? What was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ that enables the faithful to inherit eternal life? What did God accomplish in the death of his son that enables the faithful to inherit eternal life. So that's the question that we'd like to deal with this evening. It's a very important question. It's a question that has the potential to become extremely complicated. It has the potential to have so many side issues which are very interesting and are things that as you become familiar with the scripture and you study the Bible, they are things that you'll delight in and become very interested in. But as a subject for a lecture, it's a very simple question that requires a very simple answer. And this evening we hope to provide you with a very simple yet logical answer to the question, how do we benefit from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? It has to be simple because we have to understand that question. We have to have a faith that is based on logic, 
a faith that we can rely upon, a faith that makes sense. And this question goes to the very core of the salvation of the human race. So to begin with then, we need to understand exactly what the problem is that we are solving. Why is it that mankind dies? Well, it wasn't always the case. And to answer that question, we need to go back to the very beginning, to the book of Genesis, to the creation of mankind in Genesis chapter 1. When God created this earth, some, or this earth as we know it, he created everything on the earth, it was in a very good state. We see passages from Genesis chapter 1, after each day God looked at what he'd created and he saw that it was good. Genesis 4 and verse 1, God saw the light and it was good. Genesis 1 and verse 10, God saw that it was good. Verse 12, God saw that it was good. Verse 18, God saw that it was good. Even after the creation of man, in verse 31, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. And we can look around the world today, and we can see that the, the world is not in a very good state. The world is full of corruption and violence and sin and immorality, sickness and disease. It cannot be described as very good, and so we have to ask the question, what happened? If you have a look in Genesis chapter 2, God gave the first man, Adam, a very simple command. He said to Adam in chapter 2 and verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So God gave a command to Adam and said, if you break this command, you will become a dying creature. And if you look in your margin against thou shalt surely die, you'll see it says there, in the day that thou eatest thereof, dying thou shalt die. We have some different translations here. The literal translation translates that, in the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. And Young's literal says, for in the day of thine eating of it, dying thou dost die. And he was telling Adam, if you sin against me, there will be a physical change in your body. You will become a dying creature. You will start corrupting until the day of your death when you will continue to corrupt until you corrupt back to dust from whence you came. And that's exactly what happened to Adam. In Genesis 3, we read in verse 6. When the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And so he broke the commandment of God. What God told Adam was that the day that he broke that command, he would become a dying creature. Physical changes would happen to Adam. And that's exactly what we read in Genesis 3 and verse 17. And to Adam God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So a physical change came about Adam, he became dying, he became corrupting, so that his ultimate end would be dust. In fact, the whole of creation went, underwent a physical change. Even the earth underwent a physical change. As we read in verse 18, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. So the earth changed and started bringing forth evil things. And from that moment forth, the earth was on a downward tra trajectory. And the conditions after the fall are horrible. Solomon wrote, looking around the earth in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, he said, Lo, I have found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. From the moment Adam sinned, the earth was never again the same. Genesis 6 and verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Again in Genesis 8, verse 21, 
Yahweh smelled a sweet savour, and Yahweh said in his heart, I will not curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And if you click over a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 6, we read in verse 11, The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And so we find the earth in a terrible state. And if we were to compare the conditions of this earth that we read of in Genesis 6 with what we see in the world today, we would have to admit that the world today is a corrupt world. It is corrupt before God. It is filled with violence. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is only con evil continually. That wasn't God's purpose with this earth. It wasn't God's fault that earth ended up like this. God is not to blame for the conditions of this earth. As 1 John 2 and verse 16 says, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, the eyes, the pride of life, these instincts of man, these instincts of Adam, they're not of the Father. They weren't created in Adam. It is of the world. It came into the world through the sin of Adam. Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore by one man... Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, it became a physical property of this world through the sin of Adam, that Adam became a dying creature. And so what started off as a very good creation turned into a very wicked creation, and a gulf was created between God and man. God who was righteous on one side, holy and just, and man on the other side who was evil and wicked with a great gulf between. So Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. And understandably, a great gulf was created because God cannot look upon sin. Man cannot be in the presence of God with such wickedness. And a great gulf was created. However, God took it upon himself to do something about that gulf that man had created. In fact, the Bible tells us that God is the only person that can do something about that. <coughs> we read in Isaiah 43, in verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no saviour. The only person who can remove the gulf that exists between God and man is God himself. John 3 verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, it was God in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And this is a very important overhead as it actually differentiates the point of view of true Bible students from that of Christian churches. It points out the relationship that God has with the, sal with the salvation of the human race. And if you were to study the doctrines of most churches around us, they would teach us, well, they would refer to the Trinity and the Lord Jesus Christ as God the Son. And they would teach us that Jesus is saving us. The truth of the matter is it is God that is saving us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that Christ came into this world as part of the work of God that he might reconcile the world unto himself. And so man created this problem. Through sin he created this great gulf between himself and God. And yet God, through his work, is going to reduce that gulf. In fact, that's where we get the word religion. The English word religion comes from the Latin religio, which means to tie up or to bind again. And so religion is the bringing together of God and man. So we ask the question, how is God going to fulfill that purpose? How is he going to remove that gulf? We need to understand the, the problem that is being solved. Back in Genesis chapter 2, we saw that the earth and man underwent physical changes. And we saw that the earth started bringing forth thorns and thistles. It started bringing forth evil things. And that's analogous of what happened to Adam. His body started bringing forth things that were against the laws of God. His instincts, the way his body was arranged, the way it operated, was at odds 
By nature he did the things that were not according to the will of God. And so the Bible teaches us that the problem is actually the physical makeup of man. If we were to read passages such as Mark chapter 7, it tells us the problem is actually our body. Mark 7 verse 21 says, From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. You know there is no room there for an external devil. The churches around us will tell us that by nature man is good and that he does evil things because he is prompted to do so by the devil. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that by nature man is evil and that he does wicked works because from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so we're beginning to define the problem here and we're starting to see that the actual problem is the nature of the human body. We just come over to James chapter 1. The Apostle James gives us an important illustration on how sin actually works. In James chapter 1 we read in verse 14. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And we need to understand what is going on here. What the Apostle James does is differentiate between mind and body. And we need to be very clear on why the scriptures differentiate between mind and body. In verse 14, James says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's a bodily function. If you think about hunger, you say, well, the body gets hungry. That's a bodily function. And the body will plant that seed in the mind and your mind can then decide whether to act on that and eat some food or not act on that. But eating food is, is not a problem. Eating food is an innocent activity. But the body is capable of planting seeds in the mind which lead to all sorts of acts that are at, at odds with the laws of God. And the mind then has to decide whether or not to act on those things or no. And we can draw a line between verse 14 and verse 15. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed is a bodily function. And that verse applies to every single human being that has ever walked upon the face of this earth without exception, including the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted when he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, though, is a function of the mind. It is when... Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Verse 15 applies to every human being that has ever walked on the face of the death, on the face of this earth, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ. As every man other than the Lord Jesus Christ has been tempted and yielded to that temptation, it has brought forth sin and is therefore worthy of death. And so we can see the differentiation between mind and body. We need to appreciate the fact that it's not actually the transgression that is the problem here. It is the body. It is this being tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, which is the cause of sin. And so there's this picture set for us. The landscape is drawn upon which great battle can take place. A battle between the body which is prompting and tempting a man, and the mind, which is choosing whether or not to give in to that temptation. Before we get to that, though, we're starting to get a picture of what the problem is. The problem is a bodily problem. And if we have a bodily problem, the answer, therefore, is also bodily. Let's just come back to Romans chapter 7, which is our reading this evening. So the Apostle Paul was a faithful person. He lived a life faithful to the Lord. And yet this battle was taking place between his body and his mind. 
And he writes about that battle in Romans chapter 7 and verse 15, where we read, For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I can send unto the law that it is not good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, or in my body, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And so what the Apostle Paul is describing for us is this battle that's going on between the nature that he bears and the spiritual mind, between the prompting of his body to do that which is evil and his will to serve his God. And this great battle is taking place. Verse 20, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And so by what we call in the English metonymy, he is referring to this principle in his body that tempts all men and results in most men, other than Lord Jesus Christ in transgression, he's calling that sin. And he's identified the problem for us. He has identified the problem as a bodily problem. And so he exclaims in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? That's his question. That's how Paul recognised that he would be saved. Who is going to save me from the body of this death? And so he recognised that his salvation lie in the salvation of the body, or a change of body, or having his body fixed, or having a healed body, or an immortal body, or a glorious body. There are all ways to describe the salvation of man, having this body changed from a vile, corruptible, sinful body to one that is sinless, incorruptible, that no longer serves itself. And these are not isolated scriptures. The Apostle Paul in Philippians again in verse 3, salvation, he's, he's telling us that salvation is a bodily one. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is, even, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Who can change this vile body? Again, in the Apostle Paul, as it happens in Romans chapter 8, he outlines what he's looking for. He says, we know the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. And what's he waiting for? He's waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. So Paul, at various places throughout scripture, is outlining for us what the hope of the Bible is. It is a bodily hope. So we've established then, the problem that we have is a bodily problem. And the solution that we are looking for is a bodily solution. And so the question is, how do we move from the, this body that we currently have to the body that Paul was looking for that is fashioned like unto the Lord. Well, that is the work of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, how does God save us? Well, it's very simple. God has asked us to acknowledge the cause of the problem, or what the problem is. He's asked us to acknowledge that what we have is a body in need of redemption. And he says to us, if you acknowledge that your body is the problem, I will give you a new body. If you acknowledge that your, problem, that your body is the cause of the problem, I will give you a new body. And as simple as that sounds, that is the premise upon which we are saved. That is the principle that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth to demonstrate. So how does that work? Well, first of all, we have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ came in the same body that we do. And we can turn to scriptures such as Hebrews 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So the Lord Jesus Christ had a body identical to ours. 
That's what Hebrews 2.14 is telling us. Romans 8 verse 3. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's what we are, sinful flesh. The Apostle Paul is telling us the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was identical to ours. Why was it identical to ours? What, the Lord, what God wanted to demonstrate in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was the rightful end of a sinful body. So what God did was put to death a man and asked us to agree with him that the principle he was setting forth was right. And the principle that he was setting forth was that that body, or the rightful end of that body, was destruction. And we can ask the question, why couldn't any other man do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why was it necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ to be put to death? If you just come to Luke chapter 23, it's actually a thief on the cross that answers that question for us. What God wanted to do was get us to acknowledge to him that the cause of our problem is our body. And when the thief on the cross was put to death, he had these words to say in verse 39 of Luke 23. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And so we ask the question, was it right that the thief on the cross was put to death? And the answer is yes. It was right that the thief on the cross was put to death because he was a thief. But the thief on the cross rightly realised in verse 41, he says, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. So he didn't think it was just that the Lord Jesus Christ was put to death. So the question arises, is it right that the Lord Jesus Christ was put to death? He had no transgression. Was it right that God put his son to death who had done no sin? And he's asking us to agree with him that it was right. And the fact that he had no transgression makes the point crystal clear that it could only have been because, it could only have been right because of what he was rather than what he did. And so when we look at the thief on the cross, we can say, well, he deserved to die because of his transgressions. When we look at the Lord, we say, well, he had no transgressions. If it was right that he was put to death, it can only have been because of what he was. It can only be right that God put his son to death because he had a nature, he had a body that in every other man brought forth transgression. And he's asking us to acknowledge that point. He's asking us to look at what he did to his son and acknowledge that what he did was right. And he said, if you can do that, I will fix your problem. I will give you a new body. That's what he actually says in Romans 3, verse 25. Romans 3, verse 25. It says, he that Jesus Christ, it is whom God put forward as a mercy seat in order to demonstrate God's righteousness. With a view to demonstrating at the present time God's righteousness, that God might be shown to be righteous himself and the giver of righteousness to those who believe in Jesus. So he's telling us that what he did in his work with the Lord Jesus Christ what he did in putting his son to death was so that he might be shown himself to be righteous. And he's asking us to acknowledge his righteousness by believing in what he did with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we can acknowledge that what God did was right through his son, he will be, he'll give us righteousness, he says <coughs> His righteousness, that he may be shown to be righteous himself, and if we can acknowledge that, God will give us righteousness, or he will declare us to be righteous, 
And in reality, what that means is he will forgive our sins or he will justify us. And if he justifies us, he will glorify us or give us a new body. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. That came across a lot more complicated than it sounded in my head, but that's the principle on which God is saving us. He has asked us to acknowledge that what he did in his son was right, that what he did in his son demonstrated the rightful end of flesh, and if we can acknowledge that, God will grant us with a new body. Now there's more to it than that, there's a lot more to it, because we can talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to life again, and the relationship we can have with God through that, and the fact that through a risen Lord we have access to the Father and the forgiveness of sins, which are subjects in their own right. But God has asked us, if we agree with him, that we demonstrate our agreeance in that principle. And he's asked us to demonstrate that through baptism. He says, if you believe that what I did in my son was right, then I want you to publicly enact that same thing. The Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. He's asking us to reenact the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in our own lives in an acknowledgement that the flesh is rightly related to death and that we need to put that to death and live a life which is well pleasing to God. And on that principle we can receive the forgiveness of our sins and in the age to come we can be granted immortal or immortality. It's a teaching of scripture that this reward of the faithful will be received at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at the world around us and we study the prophecies that the, we've been given concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see that the Lord Jesus Christ and his return cannot be far away. We can see the nation of Israel once more in the land as prophesied that they should be. We can see the political alignment of the countries of Europe in shape, ready for Armageddon, as prophesied they should be. We've seen the moral decline of this world as it was in the days of Noah, ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things cannot be too far away, and we urge you to look into them while we still have the opportunity, so that when the Lord Jesus Christ does come, he might find us ready and waiting for that day. So thank you for your time this evening. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. 
We also have a preaching video section where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish thought for the days often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.